Good morning, everyone. Um, still morning for another hour. So, Darren and I, we're going to talk about managing expectations, dealing with expectations, things that come up on a golf course. And in fairness, to, to do that in 40 minutes or less, I don't know is, is possible. So what we did was, was pull out, uh, I don't even know the number, we'll call it a half dozen things that are coming up most frequently in visits recently. And I think you'll notice a, a theme it, is a lot of them revolve around renovations some way or another. Now, that doesn't mean expectations don't go beyond that to just purely green speed and rough height. And you know, Steve talked about a lot of the things that you should have on paper. That's true. Uh, we aren't going to get into as much of that. But in just conversations I've had, not only this morning, but with many of you in the last couple months, or for people I've worked with the last couple of years, renovations are really popular right now. And although that's great, and, and it should continue to be that way, there is that stumbling block somewhere along the line of that expectation of what you think you're going to get immediately after and, and what you get immediately after. It doesn't mean that the product is bad, but it means that you need to grow something in. This is not like redoing your kitchen or your bathroom or purchasing a new car where you, you do it, you put the last nail in the wall and you paint it and you walk away and it's, it's done. You don't have to touch it again until you want to. That isn't necessarily the case with, with grass, turf grass management, golf course management. So those expectations can be challenging to talk about at times. Sometimes they're uncomfortable because you want to come across as, we need new greens for this reason. We need new bunkers for this reason. We're tired of pumping them out and putting sand back, which is fine, which is true. But there are some growing pains involved with that. So. I, it is a lightning round, um, but I'm hoping we don't go lightning fast through this. And, and we are um, saving some time at the end for questions, but as things come up, and if it makes sense to talk about it in a moment, shout it out. And you know, I want this for the superintendents to be important, but really for everyone else in the room, I want you to walk away with more information than when you came in. And if you're, you have a question you want to talk about, um, I know a lot of people who sit in the you know, card room or locker room or just the dining room, and they hear these conversations, they can get, uh, they can spiral out of control, right? And so we want you to be in a situation where you can go back to your facility and say, hey, we asked the question that you've all been talking about for a while, we asked it. And here was the answer. Okay, so again, if we don't even make it through our entire presentation, which I think we will, we'll have plenty of time, but if we don't, that's okay too, because we want you guys to get whatever out of this you want, okay? So keep that in mind as we go through. Um, ask, ask away. So, pretty recognizable photo, right? So I put this up there simply because it was one of the best photos I had and it, it came to mind quickly, but it, it shows a couple different things. First, we've talked a lot about labor already. And there are a lot of golf courses who have features like this. Big bunkers, big greens, big fairways, whatever it may be. But then you start to add in that labor portion of it, can you maintain this bunker still? Um, Mike, I think your slide towards the end, the survey of, of what's been changed, and I think bunker is like 48%, if I remember correctly. Of, so, so as far as superintendents go, people I work with, they're raking bunkers like every other day now. But if there's still the expectation of bunkers raked every day, that needs to be discussed. And then as it gets into uh, renovation work, I don't see anybody um, putting this on their golf course. Maybe you are, I just haven't seen the plan for it. But when you're looking at bunker renovation or green renovation, fairway expansion, it is good to solve your problem, whatever that problem is, bunkers that wash out, whatever it may be. But as you look at the architectural drawing, as you talk through this as a facility and something like this comes to mind, you need to ask yourself, can we maintain that? Can we meet those expectations? Maybe you can. A lot of what you heard today is perhaps you can't. And I don't know when that day comes that, that we can again. I don't know when all this labor comes back to golf. But if I were to do this project today, and someone say, can we maintain it on our budget, and our labor? We want to hand rate bunkers like we always did. I don't know. That would, that would give me some pause. That would make me think about, this design in particular, do we need to reshape that to meet our facility's needs? Whatever they are. 
So we can just, you know, Bunkers, and I think Steve is the one said it, Bunkers is, uh, or are the number one project I see, probably Bunkers, Tees, uh, practice areas, greens, they're all up there somewhere, but Bunkers is a big one. If there's a lot of them, uh, they can be a big number, especially if they wash out, you have to add sand all the time with the labor you have. But this to me is a prime example of, you do new bunkers with the latest technology with a liner, with the latest sands, the same sand that all your buddies have and it's the best sand out there. It doesn't mean that the day you put it in is gonna play exactly like those bunkers that were done a few years ago or the way your bunkers will play even in the next couple of years. So as you look at some of these photos of completed projects, I like the one on your, I guess, top left with the rope around it. You know, showing this is a brand new bunker. All sodded, new liner, new, new sand, and it's still closed. So even when it's new and completed, it's still closed. It still needs time for the sod to grow in. Maybe the sand needs to be tamped down more. It's just not ready for play yet. So it's one of those managing the expectation of, I can't wait to get our new bunkers done. I can't wait to play them. But you may be waiting a little bit longer than you thought because it still needs time to mature and grow in. We don't want you walking on the sod, disrupting the sand, the liner needs time to settle into place, whatever it may be. This is, this is that managing expectation, um, especially around bunkers and, and projects in general. And I use this photo, this is something, you know, for those of you who are doing a bunker project or maybe have recently, you've probably seen this photo, maybe you've taken on your golf course of that, that shifty new sand. And every case, I would say every case, I mean, Darren, where someone does a new bunker, new bunker project, we get this question. We thought the sand would be firmer. We thought it would play differently than, than it is right now. We played the course up the street. They had the same sand, our superintendent tells us. Their bunker sand is firmer than ours. Maybe true. Probably all true. Theirs could be a few years older than yours. The day you lay it and work on it, compact, start raking it, it's going to get firmer every day from there. But again, the expectation is these are new. We expect them to play like we thought they would play, we expected them to play, and that might not be the case. So it's, it's one of those conversations you need to have as, as committee people, and certainly superintendents, but you need to talk to your decision makers to say, yes, we need to fix our bunkers, for example. But here are some things that you're gonna have to deal with for a little while. You can accelerate this, you can purchase tampers, you can, you can plate compact this more. There are things you can do to accelerate this, this farming, but if the expectation is we did bunkers, they're done, we can move on and not talk about them again, I don't know if that's the case. We really haven't seen that yet. So it's just something of, of, of communication piece moving forward with everybody in your, in your committee. Yeah, at this stage, um, it's not big enough for both of us, so I'm gonna work down here from the floor. But you know, one of the things that, uh, you know, dealing with bunkers is the installation of liners. Um, become extremely popular, the hard liners in recent years. And one thing about these hard liners, they add a hell of a lot to the cost of a bunker project. Um, now, there are, those costs can be recouped over time with labor, with longevity of the bunker if they're properly maintained, um, and those sort of things. And you're going to have better playability. When you get that heavy rain, all of a sudden the sand's not washed out and contaminated with soil. But the one thing that I've seen too many times, especially as sand prices have increased, as material prices have increased, you know, well, we still want the liner. Yeah, but we only have, you know, 1.25 million to do the project or whatever that number is. Well, we'll use less sand. Um, and so the first thing you do, you just spent 1.25 million and you engineered a flaw into your project instead of maybe appropriating you know, additional funds or whatever to do the project right. Because hopefully you're not doing that project for, you know, next month when it reopens or whatever. You're doing that for the next 10 years or the next 12 years. So in any type of renovation project with costs increasing, and by the way, this happened before costs were increasing, value engineering occurred. Um, but the bottom line is you you're think about the, the long-term impact of short-term savings that may happen with your project. So I think you know that works with bunkers, that works with 
you know, how much sod do you use on a project as opposed to seeding an area or not disturbing an area. All of these things that, you know, if you look at it over the cost over a longer period, a 10 year period versus over, you know, FY 2022, I think you'll find out that the value is in doing it right um, and doing it properly. You know, we've talked about labor. Um, I probably literally had half a dozen conversations in the last two weeks with superintendents that I work with, like the H2B lottery, you know, we're hoping that we get our H2B guys. And it, it it's really concerning, um, especially when you look at, you know, areas, you know, this is a metropolitan area, obviously, area around Washington, DC, those areas where they're on pins and needles. They've spent a lot of money in the H2B program, and they're just hoping that they get their guys. And if they don't, there's going to be a void, and there's going to be trouble with them trying to find people. So all of a sudden, the, the aeration you know project that you did, that you had people working sand in with a half a dozen blowers and those type of things, uh, you know maybe there's not the number. You don't have a half a dozen bodies to do that. So you're putting a, a drag mat on greens with a cart, which again, not ideal, but one guy doing the work of a half a dozen or more. Um, you know, the, the other thing that we're seeing a lot in terms of aeration, one, because of labor, uh, two, because a lot of people want to play golf. And, you know, when greens are aerated, everybody is really happy, as you well know. Um, but the fact is that, you know, there's a lot of different ways to, you know, aerate greens. Um, it's not just, you know, the, you know, we aerated, you know, two times, you know, per year for the last, you know, however many years, using five eighths inch coin times, we top dress, we fill the holes, and we're done. Well, maybe there's other options with smaller times uh, that can have better playability. Um, it may just be because, you know, we see courses not uh, able to complete aeration as they normally have because they don't have the bodies because of the time of year they've lost their seasonal employees. So with that, again, when we talk about how green chairmen can help manage expectations and how the superintendent and the green committee can work together, you know, there may be times where your aeration programs may not be as aggressive as they once were um, or what you would normally do. So there has to be communication that, hey, one, we're, we're doing this because we don't have the number of people that we need or you know we've gotten interfered with by weather so we had to do less and what happens from an expectation standpoint when you do less is the assumption becomes well they don't need to do that aggressive core aeration where they disturb the green the greens we didn't have a problem this year and that's generally not the case it's a cumulative thing over time so i guess from messaging from you know superintendents and you know in the room is you know, one, be flexible because there may be ways to get stuff done that's different than what you've done in the past. And, you know, for the Green Committee folks in the room that, you know, you can provide support for the golf course superintendent by helping to communicate the message sometimes that we did things differently, but this isn't something that, you know, we may do every year. We may back go back to our old plan uh, when we have the resources to do so. I've heard in the last couple of years this, this golf boom post post COVID or post pandemic of do we need to aerate in general or do we need to aerate like we used to? The expectation is, as Darren said, we want to play golf. We want to be on as, as soon as we can in the spring and go as late as we can in the fall. So can we aerate, you know, midwinter? This winter, perhaps. Winters in the past, who knows? It's a, it's a question mark. But I like to answer that question with a question, and especially when I know the golf course of how are your greens? How have they been the last 10 years? And, and when the answer is generally, our greens are great. We put them against anybody. That, that's, they've answered to me, they've answered their question of, can we not aerate because we want to play golf? Well, you just got to, done telling me you have some of the best greens in the area. And here's what you've been doing for a long time. Now, to Darren's point, maybe you can adjust some of that. Different times, a little bit different timing. That's possible, but to flat out say, we want to play golf, we just don't want to aerate for a while, I, I, I wouldn't do that. Because the expectation is, we're going to be as good as we can be, 
you know, May to September, October, whatever that golf season gives us. That's when we're going to make our money. We need to be as good as we can. You can't really back down on some of these things that, that you know what to do uh, and, and how you got in that position. So here, here's, you know, this is part of a renovation down in uh, Virginia Beach. Um, they rebuilt the entire golf course, basically pretty extensive project, even rerouted some holes uh, for a golf course that was only built back in 1995-96. Um, so you look at this image of this green here, and yeah, there's a blemish here and there, but the heart of the green is pretty solid. So again, we talk about expectations coming out of the renovation. Is this green ready to open? And again, this is October, I believe, when this picture was taken. So we're not going into the heat of the summer. It's not Memorial Day. Um, and there was a significant back and forth because you have some folks that the expectation is when we open that green, it's going to be like a pool table. It's going to be perfect. There's not going to be a blemish. We just spent X number of million dollars, and when the golf course opens, it should be perfect. Well, even if they wait, it's not going to be perfect. But here's another contingency, and it's usually the larger contingent that's, you know, are we going to damage the greens playing with them now? And if we're not, I'd really just like to get back to playing my golf course. So again, it's a matter of, you know, managing, you know, having those conversations. Um, you know, it's, it's not trying to figure out who's going to win out or not win out. Um, but you look at that green and you say, you know, okay, it's pretty good. But then you look, same golf course, well, you know, one of the most difficult areas to get established is generally the cleanup passes of a putting green. Um, that looks pretty ugly. Um, so again, that's where you juxtapose that against the conditions in the middle of the greens, do you want to open the greens at this point in time? And it becomes a matter of expectation. It becomes a matter of if you do open the greens at this time, there's going to be some people disappointed when they get out there and visually see that. Um, but the only thing that I'll add to that is at no point, if they keep it closed until May of this year, they're still going to get out there and the greens aren't going to be perfect. There's still going to be blemishes. And oh, by the way, anybody that's grown in greens and managed them in that first full season, um, you got to baby them a little bit anyway, especially when you get into the heat. So they're not going to be as fast as they will ultimately be. Uh, they're not going to be as firm as they will be because getting the turf through the season alive is the critical part of it. So yeah, what, what Darren said is exactly Right, what I, what I tell people, so this is a course that I work with, and I, was, I took these photos, and, and with any golf course, if you have 300 members or 1,000 members or just uh, less than 100 members, you're going to get different opinions based on who you talk to. So in this group of people, they had those who said, are we going to do, they, they asked the right question first, are we going to hurt the grass if we play on it in a month? And the answer was no. The superintendent felt comfortable with it. I was comfortable with it. So that answers the one question of can we play? The second question is from the people who didn't expect to see this of why would we? Why would we host people out here? Why would we invite uh, these conversations? But that's where these, these conversations, and putting greens in particular, get really tricky with green uh, chairman, green committee folks, and board members of the expectation of we're going to close the greens for six months, eight months, whatever it is to redo them. And when we open, we are not gonna have a blemish. And, and I just don't know that's the case. I mean, we work with greens that are 100 years old and have some blemishes. So, you know, these are one year old. And then, and then the question really gets, or the conversation really gets challenging where, to do what Darren said too, of what's the playability expectation year one, year two, year three, year five, year whatever. Because if you have, again, 100 year old greens, let's say, push up greens around here, maybe a bent poa blend, that are good, really good in fact, but it's just time for new greens, new technology, new grass, new architecture, whatever the answer. If the expectation is when we open those greens June 1st, they're going to be just like the greens we closed 
last September, last August, you're going to be disappointed. You're going to be disappointed. I mean, I, I put it in reports. I've talked to people all the time. Of, my goal for you as a superintendent, your superintendent's goal, that first year should be to keep as much of that gra grass alive as possible. As much. And I'll tell you, you're going to lose some. So I'm giving you what I would say is the realistic expectation versus these are brand new, we shouldn't have an issue. That, that's, that's when these conversations get really challenging, really tricky. Of, I'm telling you, you're going to lose some grass. You want to keep as much of that alive as possible. They're going to be maintained at a higher height, especially during the season. They're going to be watered for plant health, not playability. You, you shift from what a superintendent does every day in managing a plane surface to now we're back to growing grass, right? Now, now it's a crop. We're truly growing grass to manage a, a crop versus we can get back to managing a plain surface, but if we don't do the one thing right first, if we don't grow the grass correctly the first year or so, it just takes longer on the back end to manage that plain surface. These, again, these are expectations that need to be set and talked about. It might make everybody happy. Those people just aren't gonna believe you, and that's okay. But you're going to have to have these conversations to at least lay that groundwork and say, here's what we expect. Here's our plan. Our superintendents laid everything out. We know what to expect and plan for. And here's what you should expect coming out of it. And there, there's an irony about that particular golf course because I actually worked with them from the time they opened from brand new back in 1996, 97, and consulted with them for 20 years. Elliot takes over and they decide they need to rebuild the golf course. So I'm not sure how good of a job I did. Um, but uh, yeah, it's. Um, I've been on greens for 20 some years or so. It, it's, it's interesting, you know, you mentioned 100 year old greens, new greens, or whatever. We always get the question what's a life expectancy of a putting green? And, you know, I don't know that, I mean, there's some answers for golf course owners from a depreciation perspective, but. Um, especially areas where we don't have salt problems, I don't know what the life expectancy of a putting green really is because we have some really, really good ones that are over 100 years old now. Um, but you have to, you know, when talking about major renovations and things like this, you, you know, are our greens consistently meeting our expectations on a daily basis? Uh, and if they are not, then, you know, you need to make a change, whether it's regrassing, rebuilding, or whatever. So. Those are, you know, when you talk about renovations, the reason that you renovate is because you're no longer meeting the expectations and the product that you're trying to sell is not adequate. Of those expectations, Elliot, what, what's the time frame you guys would want a renovation done before one of your championships was held? Is it three years? You know, before you think that renovation peaks, so to say? Well, it, it's, it varies uh, depending upon um, you know, the area, the growing area, but uh, I would prefer two full seasons of growth in like this neck of the woods. Now, we do stuff down in Florida and where they do renovations with, you know, 12 month growing season essentially where it can be much less. But, uh, you know, I think um, a great example, uh, Congressional back in 2011, when we had the US Open there, um, they didn't complete the renovation of those greens until the fall of 2010. So we didn't even have, you know, a full year under our belt before we went with the US Open and we discovered that, you know, it, while they looked great initially, we had some pretty crappy weather. I mean, you know, we had record June temperatures for that area, of course, during advance week. Um, but the grass could not hold up to the rigors of everyday preparation for a US Open, especially when we threw in some bad weather. So I, I prefer two full growing seasons. And you know, if I work on a project and we're talking about putting green renovations in, in, in this area, that's I'm going to say that the putting putting greens will never be better than they are in their second full growing season. That doesn't mean they can't be that good for a long, long time. But after you get through that first season and make it into the fall, and hopefully you've made it through in good condition and can really start dialing things up, I think that second full growing season is perfect. I think that's a good expectation to put on it, yeah. Yeah, and, and we're not, 
Sean, so Darren gave you from a U.S. Open perspective, but any perspective, that, that two years, yeah. we would tell anybody of, you got to get through that first year. And the better you get through that first year, the better viewer two is going to be, and, and that, you know, how quickly that comes. But you got to get through that first one. Yeah. yeah. I got a question. Um, so we're all about to go into our member guests uh, season, going around visiting all our friends. You, we're talking about expectations. Can we talk about setting expectations at our own facilities, you know, from a day-to-day -day versus member guest preparation? We were just talking about championships, but, you know, when we're showing off our course to our friends and colleagues and business partners, you know, can we talk about differentiating expectations from day-to-day -day play versus the lead-up into some of those events? Well, can you start? I'll say, um, well, I'll, so I'll take the day-to-day. -day. Um, to me, these expectations to your, are best if they're written down. You, you got to have these in your your SOPs laid out, and, and and with differences in there for or you know fluctuations with weather, you can build in some labor in there. But um, the expectation for a daily play is is clearly different than there was a member guest slide and, and a U.S. Open is is the most extreme example probably in terms of labor and, and conditioning. Um, but you need to lay out the expectation of, we're gonna maintain a golf course every day in a changing environment. So it doesn't mean that what you played on Monday or Tuesday is what you're gonna get on Friday. It, and not because the superintendent did any more or less, it rained, or it's 100 degrees and hasn't rained and we're just trying to hold on, whatever that is. So those are expectations that also need to be baked into the overall expectation. Every superintendent in this room wants to give U.S. open conditions every day. It's just the way it goes. Sometimes it doesn't happen like that for whatever reason. Whether it's labor, oftentimes it's weather. Um, but you need to have, I think on paper, at least general guidelines to steer, steer the ship. We want green speed to be in this range. Weather provided, we like bunkers rate every other day, at minimum, whatever it is, fairways, and, and, and have everything laid out. Because at the end of the day, that's how the superintendent and their team are going to be graded anyway when you get into uh, review time and bonus and raise time and everything you get to. That's, that is clearly defined now to say, okay, you met every expectation or you exceeded expectations and all these things are going to be laid out for you. So, job well done. Or, you didn't, why? Do we need another top dresser or more greens mowers or new equipment, whatever that may be? So, well... And one thing I'll add, I'm a data guy. Um, you know, I understand, you know, the stim meter can be used for good or for evil. Um, but it, it's a situation where there has to be some benchmark that you're measuring against. And I know some people say, you know, I never stim greens, you know, speed's not a problem with my golf course. If that's the case, God bless you. Because I wouldn't measure either. But I run into too many situations where no one's measuring anything, and it's just this he said, she said about green speed. You know, oh, the greens were slow the other day, or, you know, you know, oh, the greens were great on Saturday, but they were a lot slower on Sunday. And there, there's so many factors that are in there, and, you know, having data, and, you know, again, we, we've released the GS3 ball, we're slowly rolling it out, where you can measure speed, and you can look and say, we have this maintenance standard, that our putting green range is 10 and a half to 11 and a half on a daily basis. And you can have the data to say, well, we were in that range, you know, 66% of the time, we were faster, slower, or whatever, and actually have data because there, there is, you know, nothing worse than when somebody has a bad day putting and they don't think they're a bad putter, it becomes your problem. So I, I think it's, you know, again, I'm not for posting green speeds. I think it's the most ridiculous thing in the world because I don't know what time, the speed was taken, there's so many factors that are involved, I just think, but at least measuring so that you can have an intelligent conversation about it instead of this back and forth, um, you know, between the green chairman and, you know, a member that's upset um, or what have you. The other thing, the other part of Jeff's question, just um, one brief thing, is make sure you're setting expectations based on your golf facility, your niche, the clientele that you serve. Are you a golf club or you're a country club? They're different animals. Um, too often, and I'll 
since it's not in this general area, I'll pick one very in because I've visited them for a long time, great association with the USGA. I'll visit a course and, well, I played Mary the other day and you, you did that, we, they did this, and you know, why can't we do that here? Because you're not Mary. Ben Hogan's not hitting a one iron out of your 18th fairway on the final round of the US Open anytime soon. So there's that factor of it. But make sure that you're comparing you to your niche and the expectations of your club and not the expectations from another club. Um, and again, as you know, you mentioned member guests, everybody ratchets it up a little bit for member guests when conditions allow them to do so. And, um, it's great to be able to enjoy those conditions, but realize that even the golf course that you're, you know, that you went to probably doesn't have those same conditions every day. Would you suggest other factors along with the stint measurement, like rainfall, whether it's been rolled, humidity? Yeah, and I, I believe, you know, ironically, when you when you look at the, you know, talk about the GS3 app, the Deacon app, the also the USDA has all of those factors can be included and that information can be presented graphically to you know what what practices were implemented on a given day what was the weather conditions um, so you know looking at clipping yields all those different type of things can provide an awful lot of uh, good information in that regard but the more data that you have and the more information the better off i think things are going to be hey look when it rains the greens are going to be generally, for sure, they're not going to be as firm. Uh, and they're probably going to be slower. Even though initially in the morning they may be as fast, they slow down more during the day because of the wetness, you know, that's in the turf grass canopy. So, um, you know, again, I just, I think that, you know, the more factors that you have an understanding of and how they affect green speed and performance of the greens, not just speed, it's not all about speed, um, I think is beneficial. And I want to, so something Darren said, uh, <coughs> championship related, of course, or golf daily expectations. If, if you're laying out expectations, and green speed comes up all the time, right? I mean, golf courses are always measured on their greens. Whether you like it or not, it's just the way it goes. I've never been to a golf course with terrible greens, but the golfers come off and say, boy, the bunkers were really good today. It just doesn't, it doesn't work like that. Greens drive everything. If the greens are really good, everything else is really good. And you've got all the correct sizes of shirts in the pro shop, and the, the chicken sandwich was perfectly cooked. And like, everything works better. But if you are a golfer who plays every day at 7 o'clock, or you're a golfer who can only play at 3 o'clock, you're not playing the same golf course. Certainly as it relates to green speed and perhaps firmness, because the crew's probably been out watering during the summer doing something. So something else to talk about with expectations as it relates to green speed. Those who, you know, the dew sweepers and the ones that are right on the heels of the main seed, they're, they're putting right behind the roller. They're putting the fastest greens that day. And then every group after them is playing incrementally slower greens. It could be as much as a foot slow. And we take this data that and all of our championships, uh, uh, advanced week is all throughout the day, and then and then championship rounds are morning and evening because we can't be on during the day. But we want to know how much the greens are slowing during the day. It's happening to your course too. So when you, when golfers come in and they're that evening afternoon golfer and they say the greens were really slow today, but you talk to somebody in the morning and say the greens were perfect today. A, they may have just lost their bet for the round, which that happens, or they're not they're not wrong. I don't know if the greens were terrible that day, but they're definitely slower. They were slower that day. They, they played in the afternoon. Yeah. Just one thing to add to that is it is the extreme rare exception that a putting green is faster at three o'clock in the afternoon than it was immediately behind maintenance. Um, I know. I agree. <laughs> so you're, you're good at TV speeds up there. Well, the thank you. That you took the words right out of my mouth. So, but when you hear Paul Azinger say, "Oh, they're they're getting crusty and they're really starting to speed up," there's a reason why we got to double cut and roll them every day, sometimes twice a day, in order to maintain you know the the speeds for a championship. But it, it's the same with you know at a golf facility. I mean, you know that. If they got faster in the afternoon, maybe we could skip mowing tomorrow. But that's just not the way it works. 
Hey, Nicola, as Reeser said he did on foot traffic, was absolutely shocking. I don't know how anybody makes a putt after 150 rounds go through. I can make a putt after one go through. Well, I, mean, <laughs> I played it on his true. <laughs> Questions on it? must be like, like preparing a, page, a place like that page black for a U.S. Open. How do you even fathom doing that? So the place get extra property on the planet. Just got so much. Play. No golf carts, restricted play. <laughs> it's the most protected property on the planet. Well, and I, I think it's important to realize as well, even, you know, I'll, I'll compare it to Tory Pines, because I assure you that Tory Pines does more rounds than Beth Page because they have golf all year round. If you're going to host a U.S. Open, there's going to be things that you have to do in advance to limit tee times and start backing off traffic and protect the golf course in preparation. Uh, so you start working with them well in advance for those type of things. So we are able to get some concessions that make it so it's not exactly like under normal conditions in terms of the amount of play. Um, you know, there's renovation discussions and those type of things. I mean, you know, Reese Jones, I believe, redid bunkers at Beth Page, you know, prior to the first open there. Uh, the second open, we needed canoes and everything else just to get through it, so it's a little bit different. But, you know, we were able to work with, whether it's, you know, a private club and the club, you know, club management team, if it's municipal property, you know, the course officials, whoever's in charge, to say, these are the things that we need to do. And, um, you know, in full disclosure, I can't speak to Beth Page because I wasn't there during the Open at 09, but I can speak to Tory Pines. The golf course was really good. Um, it was in fantastic condition. Was it good as, as good as the country club last year? No, it wasn't. Um, so it, it's, and you know that going in, but it's nice to be able to go to those kind of places to, you know, host golf championships where the general public can get out and play them. So um, it's it's different for sure. I can tell you that. Okay, so uh, sticking with renovation and expectations. So this photo here, you see, uh, this was a sodded. Uh, this was a green, but tees. See a lot of those, even fairway expansions. I showed you the bunker. So I've heard people say, well, let's not. We won't seed our greens because that takes longer. We'll sod them. We'll be on them quicker. What what they really mean, although they're not saying it, is when they say we're going to be on them quicker, I know what they mean is they're going to meet our expectations quicker. And that still isn't true. Yes, you could probably be on a side of green a little bit quicker because you're bringing grass with it. You're bringing a mat with it. But now look at these two distinct layers. The USGA green was sod on, on top. And this is contract grown sod, which is what I would recommend you do if you're going to do this process. But either way, you're bringing a different layer. You're introducing something different to the green, which is going to require management. So in this case, they're going to be out there aerating more during the year. And not, not big times. It's not the aeration that you may be thinking. But again, the expectation is our greens are brand new. They're sodded. They're contract grown. We delivered our mix to the contractor. We gave them our seed. We, we, we spared no expense. That's true. But there's still things that are going to have to be done after the fact. Because if you let this situation get worse, now you may be into where you started. You've got too much thatch on top. You can't get water down deep. You can't get roots down deep. So it's another thing that there's a trade-off. I was on a conversation with the New York Mets superintendent just a week or two ago on C versus side. He wanted me to write out something for his committee, which was fine. There's pros and cons to both. What you choose to do is largely up to you. I, I've seen them both work, and Darren has too. Both work very well. I don't have a problem with sodding greens anymore. I remember when I was in school, um, or even coming up, there was this thing that you had to see greens. You gotta get greens to uh, mature in place and get used to their environment. And that's, that's fine, that's true. But with our grass technology and the technology and our understanding of contract growing sod, you can bring in the exact grass you want on the growing medium you're gonna put it on. It's not exactly the same thing anymore. And we just talked about getting through that first year anyway. So, Again, there's, there's that conversation piece of if we expect to be on the greens sooner or we think we can be on them and they're going to putt and play like they did before we renovated, so we'll spend the extra money on sod. 
I just don't know that I can tell you that's the case either. It just, it just isn't there. There is still things that need to be done, and you need to bring that sod um, through that first year again. You haven't skipped that first year just because it's sod. You can see that you know it's a hockey puck. It's no, it's no greater than an inch deep. That's all the root mass you brought over. That's what you expect to play on and manage as a playing condition. It's, it's not ready yet. It still needs time. It may look ready. It may look better than the seeded greens we showed you. But it's still not ready yet the day you get on it. Yeah, and, you know, the one thing about sodding, when I started with the USDA, I, I was vehemently opposed to sodding primarily because, you know, whether it was putting green sod, fairway sod, or tee sod, was based on where you laid it, not the height of cut of the grass or whatever. It was a very, you know, oh, here's your, you know, creeping bed grass. It's mowed at 400, you know, put it on your green or do whatever. Now these sod farms, I mean, they're mowing sod at you know an eighth of an inch. They're putting growth regulators. They're doing everything. So the quality of sod that's available um, is really, really good. And, and of course, the the ideal situation is you know a la Wingfoot, where they took the sod off of their greens, rebuilt the greens, and put the sod back on their greens, so it was acclimated to that area. Um, in you know everything they needed to supplement, they grew on site. So not everybody has the land area to do that or whatever, but that's kind of the holy grail of siding. Anyway. So finally, to wrap up, um, leave uh, you know opportunities for questions on other topics that might have come up this past week. Um, you know this green right here. This is from the Country Club. This was Sunday. Um, you know, winding down towards the end. And this is where, you know, talking about expectations of, you know, I've dealt with people that look at that green and say, man, that green's beautiful. It's, you know, got a little camouflage in it. You can tell it's really fast and it's firm. And other people will tell you that that green was dying. It was not, I assure you. Um, but again, it, it's, you know, having an, an understanding. I, I work at, you know, I work with facilities clubs and, of course, consulting basis that say, we don't care as much about what it looks like. We don't want it dead. But if it plays good, we're happy. And I've been at other facilities where it's like, we want green, we want lush, we want the golf course. So having an understanding of what your membership wants, and again, having a clearly defined goal is critical. Um, you know, the one final thought I have with superintendents working with green committees, um, is you know I don't I don't like a lot of corporate speak, but managing up. And what I mean about that is, as a superintendent, going to your green committee and telling them what you need, not letting the green committee come to you and tell you what you need, but the, what they need. Because generally, from the perspective of you know working with a committee and working with a membership or a customer base, um, they're needs or what they think our needs are different than what the actual needs are at the golf course and for every one of those you know wants or needs that the membership thinks they have that may be something that is a need that the superintendent and your maintenance team have that gets taken away from you it's a zero-sum game there's only you know such a big pot to be able to work with so try to do your best to make sure that you're on the same page with your green committee and if there is conflict Please take the time to resolve it in a professional way. Yeah, I, and just I have one last thing, just think of expectations in this. And Darren and I will both hear it when we make our first CCS visit after the open, so on like June 21. We we want that. We want that in our golf course every day. That's our expectation, because we're a championship level golf course. Okay, and, and you probably are. And you everybody's seen this on your greens, and a lot of people manage to this every day. That's fine. But when you really get down to the nuts and bolts of what you saw on TV, you know, the weekend when you tuned in, or maybe you tuned in Thursday through Sunday, and that expectation versus what you need to do every day. Every day. We had tremendous weather at the country club. It was um, dang near perfect. Saturday was about as best of a golf course condition I've ever seen. The weather was perfect. Sunday morning was great. Sunday morning was as great. Um, so then you get into, you know, we want that every day. Because the assumption is that the country club does that every day. 
And I can also assure you that they don't do that every day. And a lot of these things you shouldn't try to do every day, but sometimes you just can't. You can't manage to this every day because we live in the Northeast where it's going to rain. It's going to rain eventually. It's going to snow eventually. It's going to do something eventually where you just can't do this every day. But that's the expectation of if they can do it, we can too. We've got a big budget. We've got a big staff. We're in the New York Met area. We need to be this every day. But you don't know what they're like every other day. Okay, they're a U.S. Open, as Derek said. There's a lot of things that happen for a U.S. Open that just don't happen every day. Uh, but the expectation is, when you see it on TV, that that's what we should have. It's going to come up again uh, next month, right? It resurfaces every spring when golf season starts of look how beautiful that is. We should have that. Well, okay. I mean, there's a reason why they are who they are, and, and we all look forward to spring. Uh, and it's not something that you can necessarily do again every day to meet that, that daily expectation. So... We'll move on to, we've got a little bit of time. So we've, this is our round table. I'm glad we've already kicked off some conversation, but we've got another maybe 10 minutes or something. So questions about anything? Uh, any comments on best practices for fairway expansions where you want to get more bent grass into what had previously been a new grass area? So you want to cut out some rough and add? Right. Yeah, well. <laughs> First best management is get an architect to draw that line for you. Um, but once you have that, obviously strip away, and you need to get into <clears throat> prepping that, that soil. You need, there's probably more aeration that goes involved with that, maybe some composting. But you need to prep that, I'm going to call it a seed bed. You can sod it, it's the same thing. But you need to give that something the roots almost initial um, establishment. You need to be able to hold moisture, hold nutrients right away. And then there's that, that bunker photo I showed, but you got to keep people off of it. Yeah, we got to keep carts off it for sure, foot traffic for a little while, but uh, it, it takes some prep work. Yeah, if you're if you're incorporating into an area that has already established grass, maybe you just scalped it down. Right. Um, it, it's just repeated overseeding, trying to incorporate you know more creeping, assuming creeping bed grass, creeping bed grass into the area, and it just takes time. It, it it's not a one year deal if you choose to do it that way, but. You know, it's always the challenge of, oh, we sodded it. And then for the next eight years, it's like, that's where they sodded the fairway. <laughs> so it's, um, you know, that, that's that balance of how you want to accomplish it. But it just takes time. I mean, and, you know, I, I don't, there, there's, no, there's no silver bullet for it. Yeah, it'd be interesting to have some context as we think about our golf courses. What what, what kind of feedback process after a, a U.S. Open uh, in terms of the players, the tour players, and, and how do you guys sort of manage a course um, from that feedback in future U.S. Opens? Just curious, because it's a totally different dynamic for sure, but I'm just curious in terms of the perspective of how we think about expectations on our own courses. You know, how do you guys take year after year, and, and whether it is the players or just the, the broader USGA and, and feedback on how a course did, for example, the country club last year? Yeah, we, um, and you'll be surprised to know, we get plenty of feedback. <laughs> um, but uh, we actually uh, do player surveys after the Open. We do it for the US Open, the Women's Open, in our amateur championships. Um, and we certainly, you know, take into account, you know, the, the individual comments that are made. Um, you know, I think one of the things that you've seen over the last two or three years, for example, we're growing rough now. There, there's, you know, we still have graduated rough, but we're growing rough, like rough, that none of us in here want to play in. But um, that's directly from feedback from the players that, you know, my US Open is narrow fairways, it's thick rough, it's premium one accuracy, um, and, you know, so we've gotten a little bit away from the, you know, let's get the greens as firm and fast as we can get them. We give ourselves a little bit of wiggle room. So um, we certainly look at player feedback. Um, as a matter of fact, it's a part of my evaluation for, um, you know, every year when you talk about, you know, having standards and how you're evaluated. Um, and quite frankly, during advance week, as players come out and practice, there are certain players that, you know, hey, what about this, what about that? And we do take that into account. Um, but it depends on the player because there are certain players out there that complain no matter what. 
Um, and there are other players that when they come up and say, hey, I'd like to talk to you about something, you stop and really listen and take it to heart because you know, hey, this guy's not one of the guys that's complaining all the time. You know, he, he really, you know, this is something he cares about and, you know, but um, surprisingly, we have a very good relationship with the players. We have a very good relationship with the PGA Tour. Um, so it, it's, it's a constant feedback mechanism and, and we, we do listen and um, sometimes we, you know, execute one up, and other times we're like, no, this is just in our DNA, and this is the U.S. Open. So. Okay, yeah, good. Thank, Thank you, guys. Thank you.